Have you ever seen one of the Predator movies? Do you remember that wire they can fire which reduces an unfortunate imprisoned victim to wet bloody chunks? Similar to if you pushed a human through a huge 10 foot mandolin? Have we got a treat for you today? You can thank our Patreons who voted for this video out of a selection of topics. For $2 US you can do the same, just follow the link in the description below to check out the tiers and see if there's one which suits you. Subscribe and like to support our channel. It's free and really helps our videos reach the worldwide 40k audience we know is out there. Please, please, do it, do it, do it. Some of these weapons are just plain strange, whilst the immense power of others leaves you wanting to learn their intricacies. Let's explore the most interesting weapons of 40k, and indeed some of the most unique in any sci-fi setting. Extraordinarily, even the most armoured targets such as Astartes Terminators or Hulking Orc Mega Knobs will meet their end if caught in the crosshairs of these weapons. Have you ever seen one of the Predator movies? Do you remember that wire they can fire which reduces an unfortunate imprisoned victim to wet bloody chunks? Similar to if you pushed a human through a huge 10 foot mandolin? Which of the main factions within 40k do you believe utilises this technology in battle? I'll give you a second to pause this and write your answer in the comments, and we'll see how many people get it right. The answer to who commonly employs such brutal weaponry in battle is not the Orcs, it certainly isn't the Kroot, or even the forces of chaos. It is in fact, Craftworld Eldar. It's elves, bro. Whilst the Eldari, at least the Craftworld or Exodite variety, display a certain poise interacting with other lesser races, their occasional civility ends there. In battle, the Eldari employ whatever means necessary to ensure a conflict is won swiftly, with little to no casualties suffered by their dying race. But still, the level of suffering, as well as pure dread-inducing horror the Eldari weaponry is capable of, truly belongs within the most grim, dark of settings. Firstly, let's consider the D-Cannon. And no everybody, this gun isn't as fun as its name implies. Were a victim of this weapon to be torn apart on a molecular level, suffering the most excruciating agony for a few drawn out seconds, this would be considered a mercy. You see, there are two possible fates one could suffer being tagged by a decanon. As we've said, one is being torn apart on a molecular level, reason being that around, or rather within you and your unfortunate squad mates, a doorway through to the warp itself is being opened. So as the space around you is ripped asunder, the fabric of reality itself dissipating to open a doorway into hell itself, your body will also suffer that same fate. Or, for the unlucky ones, you will live long enough to be transported wholly within the warp. Now we could spend a full length video explaining why that is a fate worse than death, and many of you already know why, but briefly, were one to find themselves in the unlucky predicament of being a mortal shut within the warp, imagine an endless sea of predatory demons existing within the darkness of unreality, starving to gorge themselves on soul essence or the ripe bloody harvest of flesh and blood. When all of a sudden, a soul burning so bright, it's like a beacon, or rather dinner bell, materialises in your midst. That mortal, once finally meeting their end, will face the horror of eternal torment as their soul is not only gorged upon, but tortured relentlessly for all eternity. Where's your god emperor now? The D cannon, as mentioned in lore as well as represented on the tabletop, is often mounted upon a portable heavy weapons platform, a hovering construct which moves effortlessly over terrain where its callous payload can be delivered where it will cause the most trauma to the enemy's lines as well as morale. Intriguingly, the D-Cannon has also been crafted into an infantry portable version in the form of Wraith Cannons, which are employed by Wraith Guard, as well as Eldari Corsairs. In this way, the at times cumbersome nature of heavy weapons platforms can be overcome. Smaller, more agile units bearing their otherworldly payload, picking their way forward on the field of battle, or even aboard an enemy void ship, ready to inflict a fate upon their foe, far worse than simply death. But let's consider for a moment that this type of weaponry is quite ironic if not wholly barbaric, considering the Eldari race's worst fear is the loss of one's own soul. However, they seem content to inflict this treatment upon other beings. 
savages. Returning now to the struggling wire we described earlier during the video's introduction, a refined, advanced Eldari culture has seemingly spent a considerable amount of time and effort developing weaponry, which is truly horrifying. Whether the slow strangulation and subsequent dicing of your opposition is viewed by you as the very epitome of civilised, well-honed weaponry, or you believe it a savage, unnecessary, torturous approach to warfare, either way, the technology which makes such a terrifying fate possible is applied to a fair quantity of the Eldari ranged arsenal. The Doom Weaver and Shadow Weaver both are capable of projecting vast web-like nets made from this monofilament wire, whilst troop portable variants are available such as the Death Spinners carried by Warp Spider Aspect Warriors, or the Harlequin's Kiss, a pistol utilised by Harlequin Infantry. The way the 3rd edition Eldar Codex explains the Shadow Weaver's operation is that the Shadow Weaver itself creates an organic monofilament mesh which is stored in a liquid state within a magnetic reservoir. The process by which this liquid polymer is turned into a vast web-like net is done by this liquid being ejected through thousands of microscopic ducts. Spinning antigravatic clamps then spin the liquid into a web-like state, whilst it's being projected high into the air above the target. These dangerous webs then float from above the enemy, wrapping unfortunate infantry and thus disrupting the enemy's order of advance. Tiny net. Never mind the horrific, terrifying effect these razor-edged web-like wires would have as friend and allies watch on in disbelief as their fellows are shredded utterly. Bearing special mention is an extremely deadly yet unassuming weapon compared with these others. If you enjoy being alive, this staple of an Eldar arsenal is best avoided. Now the word monomolecular is thrown around a lot in 40k, but it's actually a really big deal if you're not aware. Basically, if a blade or ammunition is described as having a monomolecular edge, it means it is the thickness of a single molecule. Obviously, this is so fine that it's not visible to the naked human eye. And so a shuriken disc, a type of Eldari ammunition which is itself a slice of plastic crystal described as monomolecular in thickness, would, to the untrained observer, in its spent form, either appear similar to the infamous Ninja Star design, or hardly visible at all, considering the entire bullet of sorts is described as being monomolecular in thickness. To be honest, I'm not sure if Games Workshop properly thought that one through. This near-invisible, keen-edged ammunition once hurled at high velocities would open up almost any surface due to its fine edge, which considering the rapid succession of shots shuriken weaponry releases, is terrifying to think about. Shuriken weaponry is stored in a solid state. Shuriken pistols, shuriken catapults, or even cannons, house an impulse unit at the rear which rapidly moves forward, slicing monomolecular slices from the ammunition core in the form of plastic crystal. I'm not sure which weapon would be the worst to be on the receiving end at this point, it just goes to show what a horrific place the battlegrounds of the 41st millennium are when the more civilised species employ methods such as these. What do you think is the most horrific so far? Let's take a break from the Aldari for a while, until we return in a few minutes to detail an exotic collection of torturous weaponry belonging to their darker cousins, the Drukhari. Are you enjoying this? Remember if you'd like to be kept up to date with all the newest lore or fresh perspectives on the more established content like we're doing now, consider giving us a sub, like, share and even comment. Thanks so much. This next species is considered supreme hunters, even by 40k standards but unfortunately their gear is often not spoken about, probably because there's not a whole lot of detailed lore written, even in novel format. But let's do our best and so take a quick dive into some of the more fascinating weaponry utilized by the Krut. When your entire species overriding purpose is shaping successive generations physical and psychological traits through the consumption of other species, it's natural to develop tools which aid in this cause and of course, when the way you absorb these traits is by eating those whose abilities you'd like for your own. Now that's really interesting, Clarice. Those tools more resemble something you'd find in an abattoir or medieval battleground. 
Now the first weapon's name is also an eponym. For the purpose of the prey hook is self-explanatory. This has only been introduced within the last year, debuted with the Crude Farstalker Kill Band, but as you can see pictured here, the Crude Prey Hook eerily resembles this 12th century Japanese Kaioketsu Shogei. There's no official law on the Prey Hook, but we can easily compare it to its real life Japanese counterpart, which was primarily used to not only strike an enemy from a distance, but also entangle their weaponry, bind the person themselves, and of course be utilized as a close combat cutting tool. How unfortunate to become entangled with an accrued prey hook, injured and bound, knowing you're next on the menu. Interestingly, the rounded edge of the Kaioketsu Shoge could be used as a climbing aid. Ninja scaling rock faces, or more commonly walls and building faces. It's not hard to imagine Kroot doing the same, ranging ahead of the main body of a Tau or Kroot army, utilising their prey hooks to scale harsh, elevated terrain, in order to secure the high ground to better snipe an enemy with their Tau modified Kroot rifles. Accelerator bows are another weapon recently introduced to the Kroot arsenal by the Farstalk at Kimband. At the core of the bow is actually a crude rifle, however it can be loaded with different types of ammunition that is charged with energy through the bow attachment. These types of ammunition can be tailored depending upon the wielder's preference or purpose at the time. Whether to pierce armour with the fused bow, silently fire with the glide arrow, or create a wider range area of effect explosion with the voltaic arrow. Equipment such as the Accelerator Bow clearly embodies a more pre-industrial era style of loadout to the Kroot, who were traditionally quite primitive in their garb, as well as their general lifestyle choices, compared to their allies the Tau, or even the majority of major 40k factions in general. Now offering your service as mercenaries in the unpredictable violent era that is Indomitus certainly is a venture fraught with risk, however the payoff can be substantial. And for the Kroot, this is certainly the case. Whilst kindred groups undoubtedly have been lost to Peck. <laughs> their homeworld, through either betrayal or casualties, as are the perils of the job, many more besides have come into possession of not only rare attributes to be assimilated throughout the wider species, but also gear and weapons. Allied to humans or orcs, Many Kroot have been afforded the opportunity to obtain even Eldari or Astartes weaponry. Recently, however, again with the Fast Orca Kindred, we've seen infantry wielded heavy weapons in the Vorgite Skinner and Londaxi Tribalest. Apparently, the Vorgite Skinner utilizes an unspecified type of biomatter to charge a searing stream of energy, whilst the Londaxi Tribalest, which fills the role of anti armor, fires solid ammunition, shot at higher than typical velocities for greater penetration. This would require the tribalist shells to maintain their integrity whilst travelling at these higher speeds, but unfortunately, Games Workshop haven't released any further lore, so we can learn about these weapons in more detail. Now if you've made it this far into the crew without skipping forward, we'll leave this nugget of older established lore for you. When discussing the various weapons invented or altered by the Kroot themselves, it does bear mentioning that upon their homeworld of Peck, this primal species have hidden away a secret base of operations which seems to manufacture as well as house equipment and technologies that we quite probably have not witnessed deployed yet. This could full well explain the recent additions to the Kroot's arsenal and kill team such as the Accelerator Bow or the more mundane but still creative Quill Grenades. The truly intriguing part is that the Tau are aware of these bases' existence, however are not privy whatsoever regarding what is housed or carried out within. Alright then, keep your secrets. Good. Before we dive into the torture devices the Drakari call weapons, truly the things nightmares are made of, Let's first explore some horrific armaments which are even capable of devouring their target from the inside out, using thousands of tiny little mouths. That's right, the Tyranids employ bioweaponry in some of the most gruesome displays of violence displayed on the battlefields of the far future. And that's saying something. Interestingly, Tyranid bioforms themselves, such as the Gaunt or Warrior class subspecies, 
could very well be classed themselves as living weapons. After all, they bear all manner of organic mechanisms to aid in their functions such as oversized adrenal glands or even toxin sacs. On the other hand, biological systems we would consider essential are not natively present within these captured dissected tyranid specimens. These can be, though are not limited to, a lack of digestive tract or respiration systems. We've even witnessed in Devastation of Baal a Carnifex being decapitated by Chapter Master Dante only for its weapon symbiote to take control of its host's body, driving the enormous creature onwards in an effort to gain a foothold within the Blood Angel lines. But I digress, let's speak in more detail about the armaments Tyranid bioforms bear into battle. And so speaking of munitions which eat their targets, the Tyranid Devourer ejects parasites which bore through their unfortunate victim's body before locating the brain and consuming it. But there are different types of Devourer-like guns, similar to the Shuriken or Shadow Weaver variants of the Aldari. Smaller, massed infantry such as Termagaunts or their larger cousins in the Tyranid Warriors are both commonly known to be birthed wielding the short-range variants of Devourer weaponry. Though their size means naught, as the living projectiles are capable of locating and burrowing through the joints of even the thickest plate armour. Though when a devourer is wielded by larger tyranid organisms, such as the indomitable Carnifex, instead of these smaller parasites, they bear a variety of critter aptly called brain leech worms, a more gluttonous, rapacious parasite which are capable of burrowing into their target's bodies through their skin before devouring neurological tissues. Interestingly, these parasites are also a type of ripper larvae, another way by which the Tyranid race feeds upon the essence of those it invades to fuel its galactic journey. Venom cannons are peculiar compared to a sizable portion of Tyranid bioweapons in that they actually fire volleys of crystal type ammunition rather than living organisms or acidic projectiles. This crystalline ammunition is formed from a concentrated poison, then covered in a type of metallic coating, which, you guessed it, is also poisonous. Doesn't matter whether you're a bioengineered super soldier or star god, that's going to leave a mark. In terms of the heavy venom cannon, however, besides the crystalline ammunition being both larger as well as fired at higher velocities, once connecting with an unfortunate target, released is a wave of energy which serves to stun, confuse, and even knock over the Tyranid's unfortunate prey. Fascinating so far, but not as grim or terrifying as you'd expect from an alien race which consumes entire systems populations for sustenance. This next Tyranid bioweapon actually resembles dual wheel pistols, but is the perfect example of how Tyranid bioweaponry functions and coexists within a host bioform. You see, spine fists are so often associated with this part of a Tyranid's anatomy, the gun type appendages which resemble dual wielded pistols. However, the spine fist is significantly larger than just what is visible on the surface. You see, the spine fists themselves actually are, like a lot of the Tyranid arsenal, living creatures. On the back end of these fists, the weapon continues to travel through the host it's connected to. Comfortable. The purpose of this is so that the weapon's membranous sac connects with the host creature's airwaves. The Tyranid bioform, when wishing to fire the toxic needle type ammunition of the spine fist, exhales very quickly and firmly so that the oxygen from their airways travels through to the spine fist membranous air sac, which then releases the neurotoxic ammunition at high velocities that impact is fatal which altogether seems like it would be an uncomfortable experience if in fact these creatures were able to feel pain in the way we're familiar with the term. The Drakari truly are the masters of weaponizing nightmare concepts. From hex rifles which rapidly turn their targets into crystal statues where they stand, missiles which cause their target to implode upon themselves, and ossifactors, guns which cause a target to sprout bone intrusions from inside their body outward until they resemble some type of twisted, horrifying bone tree. Apart from the warp itself, I think it would be hard to imagine a more nightmare terrain 
than a battlefield after Drakari have passed through. Okay, before we begin Drakari weapons, something I've really enjoyed writing about, leave a comment with what you think so far is the most terrifying weapon from a sci-fi horror perspective. Then let me know if the Drakari have them beat or not. Let's hit the concept running with a close combat blade aptly, if not characteristically called, the Agonizer. We know that Agonizers more often than not take the form of a whip-like creation. However, the form and function of these cruel weapons means they've also been fashioned into flails and even claws for hard-hitting Kabbalite infantry to wield in combat. The main purpose of an Agonizer is, you guessed it, to inflict unbearable pain upon the Drakari's enemies. But this is nothing so simple as wrapping or clawing an opponent's appendage so they'd rather cut it off than continue to be at its bearer's mercy. No, the effects an agonizer has on its hapless victim is far worse. You see, the agonizer has been crafted in such a way that no matter where a blow is landed, a victim's nervous system is targeted instantly. With the advanced close combat blade attacking their nervous system with such an enormous wave of pain, it simultaneously overloads, which inevitably ends with incapacitation or death via writhing agony. Hence the name. Although Drakari by nature are cruel, sustaining their very life essence from the suffering of others, those especially twisted beings such as savage beastmasters or fast lethal reavers favor the agonizer in battle. Also, Drakari's craftworld cousins use materials such as semi-organic liquid polymer to craft some of their most terrible weaponry. The Drakari simply harness and subsequently cage the power of a sun. Yes, that's right, a sun. Did you know that plasma makes up between 99 and 100% of the visible universe from our stance on Earth? That's how hot and brightly it burns. Well, the sun's own surface, consisting of constantly shifting plasmas, burns so brightly, we can see it clearly from 93 million miles or around 150 million kilometers away. Don't look too hard into these actual facts, okay? I promise I'm getting to the point. Imagine a weapon which stores the superheated plasma of a sun itself, but is so advanced in its creation, its barrel is cool to the touch. That's insane. A disintegrator cannon fires portions of this harnessed matter directly at its unfortunate target, making a mockery of even the thickest of armors. The sheer spectacle of such a weapon lighting up the battlefield as its blast travels faster than light to impact with an unfortunate vehicle or fortification just would be the most fascinating thing to bring to life on the big screen. Hopefully we get to see something this awe-inspiring in the years to come. Come on, Cavill. Favoured by the most talented torturers of a species whose pastime is such, flesh gauntlets are lovingly crafted by homunculi for their own use as well as for grafting onto their own twisted creations. Taking the form of a glove, albeit one covered in enormous needles, their contents exact an exquisite pain toll on their victims. Standing your ground against the countless horrific predations a Drukhari raiding force presents, witnessing your compatriots fall victim to the contents of these insidious weapons is enough to leave a permanent, gaping hole where your sanity once was contained. You see, the contents of a flesh gauntlet's needles isn't something as mundane as poison or some neurotoxin. It's far more creative containing a potent, rapidly acting steroid devised by Drukhari homunculi themselves, the poor sod on the receiving end will begin to bloat in an unnatural, disfiguring way. The muscle and tissue which compose much of their body will grow exponentially, tearing through the victim's thin skin tissue. Bone will become so pressurized by the rapid growth and subsequent compression caused by the swelling of tissue and muscle that it fractures and snaps, inevitably piercing and becoming lost in the thing which was its body. Muscles bulge so massively that the being no longer resembles its previous form, but is more a wet, bloody, torn, heaving mess of meat. Not only this, consider the enormous force wielded by a homunculi subject such as a rack who bear these flesh gauntlets into battle. 
These creatures make Bane from Batman look like a small child. They aren't checking for a ripe vein to gently inject you. Those gauntlet mounted needles are going in or even through you, turning their victim into a bloody maimed mess before the potent steroid within even has a chance to travel throughout their prey's system. Lastly for the Drakari we have the Husk Blade, which is honestly such a pitiless, harmful, close combat weapon that it suits these species to a T. For those not familiar with the Husk Blade, its potency and rarity means it's wielded by the more well-to-do Drakari nobles, such as Archons or ambitious individuals whose scaling of the Drakari social ladder has yielded considerable influence so far. No less horrifying than the Flesh Gauntlet, Agonizer, Hex Rifle or Ossifactor, the effect a Husk Blade reaps upon its victims is the stuff sci-fi horror is made of. A mere scratch from this weapon will rob its victim of considerable life force with a full penetrating hit, draining their life essence completely. Until they are naught but a desiccated, well, husk. Delightful. Dehydrated. The otherworldly lethal nature of husk blades are evident in their appearance as they appear to be crafted of bone but are at least as formidable as a power weapon in combat. These blades also leave a supernatural-like trail of smoke as they move, accentuating the aura of dread their wielder no doubt already exudes. Now they may be the final species we're exploring today, but as you'd expect from literal god killers, the arsenal at their disposal is insane. Let me know in the comments if you've heard of all these ancient Xenos weapons of mass destruction. First of all we had the 40k Necron fan favourite, the Celestial Orrery. And for those of you who haven't had the pleasure, let me fill you in. Basically, this Celestial Orrery is quite possibly the most powerful weapon of mass destruction in the entire 40k setting. Basilio Foe's biomechanical phage to wipe out all the Astartes in the galaxy? Doesn't compare. Not even close. A living fleet of trillions upon trillions of individual Xenos who all compose a single intergalactic consciousness? Not sure. Uh, maybe. You be the judge. But still probably not. The Celestial Orrery is so ancient it even predates the war in heaven. And this technology, eons beyond the scope of anything humanity could hope to engineer, is yet another example of Necron tier superiority compared to the young, upstart races who dwell within the Milky Way currently. Its potential to single-handedly achieve Necron dominance in literal moments is truly mind-blowing. You see, the Necrons have within their possession a device which is the exact counterpart to the Milky Way galaxy made miniature. And though the technology or way in which this is achieved is beyond even the greatest minds, the means in operating it is not. The Orrery is more a real-time counterpart than it is a replica of any kind, for not only are real-time events which affect the galaxy such as the destruction of a planet then reflected on the Orrery, but were one to destroy a planet or even system on the Orrery itself, their real space planets would follow the same fate but in real time, spectacular, explosive fashion. I hear you say, but why has this not been used to greater effect so far? Well, the caretakers of the Orrery understand the mysterious equilibrium which must be maintained between the Orrery and real space. Thank goodness. Transdimensional beamers are fun weapons which by other races' standards would be considered weapons of immense power but to the Necrons is primarily utilised to clean up around the joint by transferring unwanted mess from real space to some random pocket dimension. Similar to the Eldari D cannon, which if you recall, transports the Eldar's foes to the warp, the transdimensional beamer can be employed in a military application by transporting unfortunate foes to these pocket dimensions to join the Necrons past discarded mess or battlefield debris. Now if you have enjoyed this and would like another video which details the more powerful, awful weapons employed by the Imperium, Greenskins, Chaos, Tau, Leagues of Votan and even Gene Stealer cults, then leave a like and a comment saying you'd like more and I'll put it together. I'd like to say a massive thank you to our Warlord Patreon member Nelson 
you're a legend mate and the support from people like you through Patreon and being such a positive member of the community and Discord motivates me so much when it comes to putting videos together and purchasing the necessary equipment and books to keep it operational. Not to mention up to date with relevant content. Again, thanks mate. Voting on content, your name shouted out in all our videos, as well as printable high-res artwork you can own are some of the perks that come with Titan Wargaming Patreon membership. There's a link in the description so you can check it out to see if it's right for you. If you like the newest Valdor lore or are keen to know what each Chaos Legion are up to right now, check those out in the description or select them on your screen now if you're on PC or TV. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time, take it easy. Have a good one.